are remade in Christ's image by the power of the Holy Spirit, represent Christ to one another and to the world. Christ identifies himself with them. Especially is this true of the saints, those who allow themselves to be totally transformed in Christ. The church, in its most basic reality, is a holy fellowship built up through the self-communication of the triune God. End quote. I think that Dulles's perhaps best-known work, Models of the Church, proceeds from this realization that the essence of the church is inexhaustible mystery to which no one perspective can give full justice. As a young priest and teacher of theology in the mid-1970s, I can testify to the theological and pastoral impact of that book, which allowed us to legitimate, to articulate a legitimate pluralism in our understanding of church, and hence to promote dialogue among different, sometimes competing perspectives, whether in religious communities, in seminaries, or in parishes. Yet the book's very success may have unwittingly fostered a too facile accommodationism, especially when filtered through the 70s soft relativism of the that's your model, that's my model variety. Perhaps this is what led Dulles to elaborate in the 1980s an approach to church as community of disciples. That without pretending to be a supermodel, nevertheless served to refocus ecclesial reflection upon the distinctive identity of this community, this assembly, this body. It also helps bring to the fore the cost of discipleship, the realization that love for the church can be, in Dostoevsky's words, a harsh and dreadful thing, not like love in dreams. Dulles's concern about polarization and the spread of an almost promiscuous pluralism in theological circles led him in the craft of theology to outline a way forward that he called an ecclesial transformative approach to the theological task. I will not endeavor this evening to expatiate upon it, save to call attention to the equal importance of both adjectives, ecclesial, transformative. It proposes an understanding of the theological task as ecclesial mission, to speak and act faithfully and creatively within, not over against the church. And here is how the Cardinal himself states it in the craft of theology. Theology must deal with new questions put to the church by the course of events and by the circumstances of life in the world. Continual creativity is needed to implant the faith in new cultures and to keep the teaching of the church abreast of the growth of secular knowledge. New questions demand new answers, but the answers of theology must always grow out of the church's heritage of faith. Can we fail to recognize in these words the very program of the McGinley Lectures? I spoke a short while before about discernment as a salient characteristic of the Ignatian charism. In words made common currency by Vatican II, the theologian standing in the midst of the church is to discern the signs of the times. But two provisals must be entered. First, the injunction of the, card, the, the, injunction of the council is that the signs of the times be scrutinized and interpreted in light of the gospel. Secondly, since the church is immersed in history, the signs needing discernment in 2008 may not be in all respects the same as those prevalent in 1965 at the council's conclusion. Allow me to hazard a for instance. 
I have suggested in other places that a great achievement of the Council was the recovery of a more ample notion of tradition, a suggestion with which Cardinal Dulles has concurred. I developed this further by distinguishing two understandings of tradition. Tradition as tradita, those things handed down, the deposit of faith, if you will, and tradition as traditio, the process of handing down, of ongoing interpretation. At the time of Vatican II, the former sense of tradition as tradita was firmly in possession, accepted by almost everyone. What was needed was to reappropriate the tradition as living reality, as more than rigid propositions unreflectively parroted. In a word, to recover a sense of tradition as traditio. Today, voices ranging from commonweal through America to first things acknowledge that a widespread biblical and theological illiteracy afflicts the church in the United States. The tradita can no longer be taken for granted as understood or even accepted. Thus, Dulles's discernment, as we heard him reiterate this evening, is that the present climate of opinion does not favor tradition and orthodoxy. Avowing this honestly does not lead him, however, to repudiate the complementary recognition that tradition is a developing thing, as he says, because the church lives in history. Rather, it spurs him to affirm with one of his heroes, John Henry Newman, that, quote, tradition develops in fidelity to its own deepest principles. A reversal, of course, is not a development. Are we then left to oscillate between shifting emphases, now on tradita, now on traditio, reduced to continual course corrections? Is the promise of Vatican II postponed to an ever receding horizon? And here is where I think it imperative to descend with Dulles yet deeper to the heart of tradition, to that fourth all-encompassing love animating these McGinley lectures, love for the Lord Jesus himself given for our sake. For the Tradita, the storehouse of church teachings and practices, point mystagogically to a deeper reality. And traditio, ongoing interpretation, is at the service of the inexhaustible revelation which it seeks to communicate ever anew. Thus, tradition at its deepest is the traditus. Jesus Christ himself handed over for our sake, who gave and gives himself out of love. To my knowledge, Cardinal Dulles does not himself employ the term traditus, but the reality of the Eucharistic Christ, the traditus, forms the heart of his teaching as it does of his priestly existence. In this regard, may I call your particular attention to two of the McGinley lectures that are absolutely vintage Dulles. And like good wine,